Hello. I don't, don't know why I just did that. <laughs> My name's Claire, uh, and I'm here to talk about infertility. Uh, normally, this morning, I would be recording um, for our podcast. I write a blog every week, and then I record the audio version to put out on our podcast feed on the silent Y. But this morning, I thought I'd do something about infertility because I saw National Infertility Awareness Week was um, on social media and was part of this whole week. So I thought, well, I'll join in. Um, best I can but maybe just with a video because I think our story of infertility is something that's really important to put out there because we don't have children we're childless we didn't get the children we didn't get the babies on the other side of the journey and sometimes it's important to see that because there's a lot of people who talk about infertility and they share the struggles and the pain which is very real Um, but they got the baby at the end of it and that can be hard to hear when you're at the beginning of that journey so I thought I'd come and just share a bit about um, our story and where it where it fits in with that narrative. Um, and I can see that the National Infertility Awareness Week people are asking us to do four different things. So um, I thought I'd just kind of do them all in one. So the first thing was, this is my story, which I'm going to tell on this video. The next one was We Can All, ways we can change the narrative around infertility, which I will do on this video as well. Wear orange, check. It's the only thing I own that's orange, so I've dug that out of the cupboard. And infertility is, which is a picture or a video of what infertility looks like. And in our family, infertility looks like this. Not me specifically, it was actually my husband. But um, yeah, I am, I share everything with him, so therefore I am also part of infertility. So our story is that we got married in our early 20s. I was 23 when we got married. We, uh, I don't think we were desperate for children, but I know that Chris always assumed you'd be a dad, wanted to be a dad. Uh, I assumed I would have children. I wasn't maternal in that, I mean, desperate to have babies kind of way, but just assumed a family would be there. Never really thought about it. I wanted to have children. I wanted to have that family unit, chat to kids when they're older. I wanted to be a grandma one day because I'd loved my grandma and the role that she played in my life. Just thought it would happen. So we, you know, at some point we decided, well, we'll we'll start trying. Um, Again, quite casual about it. Nothing happened and we wondered why, but didn't really panic or look into it. Then a little while later, my husband was chatting to his brother on the phone who was studying medicine. And he happened to tell Chris um, that possibly an operation that Chris had had when he was younger would have left him infertile, which they now know, but they didn't know back then. So um, they don't do that operation in the same way nowadays to, to avoid that situation because it left a whole kind of row of men with the same situation infertile. So we went and got some tests done, um, several tests, I think, and uh, it came back that Chris's sperm count was really low and the mobility wasn't great either. So we were, we knew we were looking at infertility. Um, we were always a team on stuff. I never for a second thought it was his problem or his issue. I thought it was our thing. You know, immediately we were infertile. That was something we needed to deal with. So we thought we'd keep trying naturally for a bit because it could still happen. But they also suggested we chat to someone about IVF and we'd have to go straight in for ICSI. IVF, which is where they take a strong sperm and a strong egg and they put the two together. And we went and had a chat with someone about it and we came out and I can't tell you why, but for whatever reason, we just, we didn't feel comfortable about it. We didn't feel comfortable about moving forwards with it. We had no issues with it. There was nothing wrong with it. It just, it didn't feel like it was for us. And we were still very young. So we thought, well, you know, we'll leave it um, and we'll keep trying naturally. That's that's our preferred route for now. And we were part of a church community. So we asked people to pray for us. We were very open about our journey from day one, telling people we're going to, you know, this is going to be tricky. Let's see what happens. Um, we also looked at lots of other options. We looked at adoption and fostering and natural IVF and embryo adoption and sperm donation, egg donation, everything that was on the table. Uh, we actually wrote down all of the things that you could do to have children and we marked them individually, one to five, depending on how popular, not popular, depending on how kind of passionate we were about doing it. And when we put them together and had a look, we were opposite ends of the spectrum on almost everything, which added even more confusion to the mix because we wanted to just do everything as a team. You know, if we were both invested in something, then we thought we'll do it. But equally, if the, either one of us had been massively passionate about, I really want to try this, we also would have tried it for the other person. But we just weren't feeling it on, on any scale. and We didn't really know what to do about that. We wanted a passion for something, but it, it just wasn't there. And I think we do one of those feelings. Um, we felt it was important not to rush into these things. And we spoke to a lot of people, some people who had adopted, some people who had fostered, some people just for general counsel and wise advice. And a lot of them were saying, you know, especially with things like adoption, if you don't have that passion there in the first place to do it, um, it's not something you do just as a backup plan. Um, and we very really, 
very quickly realised that was the situation. A lot of people suggested it to us. A lot of them had their own children. I used to like to turn that around on them and ask them if they'd considered it as well, because it's not just for people who can't have children. Um, and it, yeah, it was one of those things. We just didn't really feel any options. So that was our journey. We went back again to consider IVF later on. Again, we came away with the same feeling. This just doesn't feel right for us. Um, everything we thought we could make a path through with it we wondered about having two embryos put in um lots of different things uh we got told no one woman said they wouldn't put two embryos in because it might increase the population too far which i don't think is a standard line for the nhs but wasn't the best conversation i'd had on the phone um and just overall we didn't get feeling it was right and then i started to get quite unwell um i was tired my head was foggy i couldn't really function i just didn't feel like myself and i and it took us years to work out what was going on, but it was a hormone condition. Um, and I had a lot of treatment for that. Anyway, I ended up two years ago having a hysterectomy, which has helped me. Uh, it's put me into menopause, but I can control my hormones um, artificially now. And I'm about just sort of starting to get my life back on track. Looking back, had we done IVF without knowing any of that, that might have put me into a very nasty situation of um, being pumped with hormones with a body that couldn't cope with them anyway. So... I don't know. Some of those gut feelings are for a reason and we have peace about that. I just don't think my body would have reacted well. And if it had have, you know, even gone managed to get through, it, I don't know what kind of mother I would have been. I couldn't even function day to day very easily, just the two of us in the house with that situation. So throw a baby in the mix. I don't know what that would have done to us or to the child. So we have no regrets about any of these decisions, but they've been hard. And I really want people to know that you don't have to be desperate to the point of trying everything um you can really want children and you can really grieve a family and you can really be sad about that even if you haven't tried every single option I think there is a a general feeling out there that if you want children you'll do anything to get them and if you've tried everything then the world will give you all the sympathy in the world for not having them but if you haven't tried anything it's almost a little bit like well you didn't really try everything so maybe you didn't want them as much that's not the case not by a long shot and I think that's another narrative that needs to change um, these are big things they're big decisions they're things that can split couples they're things that can leave people very damaged it's not all good the chances aren't always great either it can cost a lot of money it can put financial strain there's so much stuff about it that can be really hard to go through that for people who decide not to I just want to say that's okay you know you don't have to force yourself into something if you want to do it great if you don't don't beat yourself up about it. There's other there's other ways. And even if the other ways don't suit you either, life is not as bad as it might look right now. If you're starting infertility and you're thinking, if I end up going through this and not having children, it's going to be the worst thing ever. Well, I'm living that story and I can tell you it's hard. It's sad. There's grief, but it's not the worst thing ever, it, especially if you stay together as a team with your partner. I think that's been huge. And we've seen couples who haven't had children who have then split. Um, and I think that's even sadder because then you end up on your own dealing with the same grief. It doesn't go away. And also, you know, it's worth noting that the grief of infertility doesn't go away when you get a baby. People still have to work through that the same when you adopt. There's still that grief there of not having your own children. It's not that straightforward. And that's why we started our podcast, because we knew there was a lot of losses that people were going through that were a bit more hidden and complicated to work through. So we wanted to talk to people about losses find out how they were coping with it, what hope they've found in it, if anything. Um, so we're on a mission to find 101 different types of loss, all kinds of loss, whether it's something like a relationship or bereavement with a person or a job or a career or a physical ability or a sense or a dream or childlessness. You know, they're all, they're all losses that need to be grieved and we want to talk to people about those. How have they worked through them and how did they get hope? So that's what we're doing. So that's my overriding message, really. There's always hope. And yet, I'm not where I thought I'd be. I thought if I was childless, I'd have a career, I'd have money, I'd have, you know, great other things to do instead. I didn't. I didn't have that. You know, a lot of my friendships changed because people had children. The family dynamics changed because people had children. Things I wasn't expecting got worse and were harder. Um, but I'm working through it. I'm still alive. And I do believe there's hope. And I don't mean hope for the baby I mean hope just whatever happens I've got something downstairs on my wall that says life doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful and I truly believe that and I'm talking to a lot of people on the podcast whose lives are beautiful because of their losses and they will say as much so I just want to give you hope it's not the end of the world it might feel like it and it does need grieving but you can get through this and um, there is life on the other side and it might not be as bad as you're fearing it is looking into it 
So that's my story. What can we do to change the narrative? Well, I think changing the assumptions around what a family unit looks like would be helpful. Um, answering the question, do I have children over and over, can get quite hard and wearing. I never know where to go with it. People get embarrassed when I give them the answer. I always want to say, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask me. <laughs> so I think it'd be really helpful if we came up with new questions to find out about people. Um, I want to talk about my, my situation. I'm very open about it. But I don't need to keep answering the question, do you have children in such a blunt way from people who don't know me? So I think it'd be really great if people could find new ways around that. I'm exploring the same thing in the podcast and in my blogs, how to speak to people who are grieving. There's lots of ways of doing that. Um, doesn't need to be walk away from it or avoid the situation. And it's the same with infertility. We need to have these conversations. So I think it's really good to do. And that would be my my thing for uh, what we can all do to make things a bit easier for everybody else so if you want to know more about my story episode three of our podcast the sign up why is me and my husband chris chatting about what we've been through in a lot more detail and how that feels and then we did another episode following on from that part two which is where people sent in questions about childlessness things they want to know that they didn't really feel like they could ask people and we did it anonymously and we answered all those questions as well so that's there if you want to episode three on the sign up why.com and uh yeah I just want to say, it's not the end and there is hope, so don't give up. Mm-hmm.